Okay, so uh, welcome back everybody. Uh, today we've got uh, Isabella talking about search frictions in international goods markets. Uh, if you're new here, the house rules are, if you have a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself and, and break in and interrupt just like you would during a, during a regular seminar. Uh, Julian is also in the chat room. So if you have a, a, so maybe a clarifying question or you don't wanna break in and interrupt, you can ask in the chat room and he'll try to get back to you there. And then we'll also have uh, time at the end for just conversation and, and, uh, and more questions and comments. Okay, so without further ado, go ahead, uh, uh, Isabel. Okay, thanks very much. Um, thanks for having me in this uh, great uh, seminar series. Uh, so this is joint work with Clémence Lenoir, who's a former student of mine at Crest, and Julien Martin from uh, uh, UCAM. And so what we want to do in this paper is uh, basically uh, study the extent to which frictions in the matching of sellers and buyers in international markets can affect the allocation of resources across heterogeneous producers. The reason why we started studying this question, which is actually kind of long time uh, ago, is that uh, there is um, increasing evidence that customer acquisition uh, is uh, an important margin that can explain some of the heterogeneity across firms that we see in the data, in particular in terms of their participation to international markets. However, it's well known as well that customer acquisition is subject to various forms of friction, such as imperfect uh, information in product markets, and such frictions might thus be a source of misallocation if they prevent the most efficient producers that are on the market to, re to reach a large enough uh, customer base. So this is basically the question we want to uh, tackle in this paper. So what we do more specifically is to build a very stylized model that uh, features search frictions in a Ricardian uh, context. So basically the model is a partial equilibrium vers version of Eton and Cortu whereby we have a discrete number of sellers and a discrete uh, number of buyers in each country that meet randomly. We study uh, both analytically and empirically the implication that these search frictions can have for the efficiency of the allocation of resources across firms. So what we show is that in comparison with the baseline Eton cartoon model, uh, which features an extreme form of selection because exposed only the most productive firms can end up being active uh, in uh, various ma uh, markets. What we show is that in the model with search frictions, uh, there is some form of competitive distortion that favors the local productivity firms. So the reason is that search frictions are going to reduce the strengths of competition among firms. And this in relative terms is going to benefit those firms that are not competitive enough uh, to uh, manage uh, selling and exporting uh, in the absence of any form of frictions. So then we use the model together with firm-to-firm -firm trade data to try to uh, estimate uh, search friction structurally at the product and country level. And then we use this structural uh, 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 estimated search frictions to quantify the inefficiency that is implied by uh, what we estimate. So as I just said, uh, search frictions in our, our model are going to uh, distort competition in favor of low productivity firms. And this is unlike the other form of uh, trade frictions that we have in the model, which are uh, standardized their trade cost. So as a consequence of this, we are going to see in markets that display high search frictions that high productivity firms are going to reach an inefficiently uh, uh, low uh, customer base while Instead, the less uh, uh, productive firms are going to uh, uh, be more likely to export than would be uh, efficient in the frictionless uh, economy. Um, of course, um, the validity of uh, our estimates, uh, so the, what, what we do is to estimate those such friction structurally, and so it's always true that the validity of our estimates is going to be conditional on the model being a good representation of the real world. So in the paper, and I'll try to do a bit of this during the presentation, even though I'm not sure I'm going to have a lot of time, uh, we try to uh, discuss what the mo moment that we use to identify such frictions could, could capture, what type of uh, features of international market this particular moment could capture, and in particular, how other source of barriers to international trade could potentially affect the moment that we associate with uh, search frictions that we use to identify those search frictions. 
So we argue uh, experts that the correlation of our estimates with a number of product and country specific characteristics is consistent with our interpretation of the estimated parameters in terms of search regions. And then once we convince ourselves that what we estimate is indeed something that relates to uh, search frictions, uh, we try to answer the initial question, which is the extent to which these search frictions can generate uh, the kind of things allocation that I discussed before. So the first thing we show is that the estimated search frictions are all the more distortive since they tend to correlate with uh, Ricardian comparative advantages. So even though this might not be true for other countries, what we see in our data is that the level of uh, search frictions faced by French exporters uh, uh, on average in various product markets is correlated with Ricardian uh, comparative advantages, meaning that uh, uh, search frictions are especially uh, costly because uh, they, uh, um, 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 they enable uh, um, high productivity uh, French exporters meet with uh, foreign consumers in those product markets in which in the absence of such frictions, they, they would be uh, quite likely to serve the foreign markets. And then the last thing we do is something which is more uh, quantitative. We use uh, the uh, estimated search frictions to conduct a counterfactual exercise whereby we assume that there is a reduction uh, in search frictions in the most frictional country that we have in our data to the mean level that is estimated for the least frictional country. And what we show is that this counterfactual reduction in search frictions induces a, a, a small increase in the volume of bilateral trade, but more importantly, it leads to a 10% increase in the mean productivity of exporters in the counterfactual world in comparison with the actual data. So this is important because it means that uh, uh, this type of uh, the policies that uh, would uh, target uh, specifically search frictions can both increase the volume of trade and uh, uh, um, improve the allocation of resources between uh, uh, potential exporters. And importantly, we compare this counterfactual exercise with what would happen in another counterfactual world in which uh, uh, iceberg trade costs would instead be reduced. And we find that for the same increase in the volume of trade, the impact on the mean productivity of exporters is instead uh, negative. So this means that if you target iceberg trade costs in a Ricardian uh, framework, you're going in relative term to uh, uh, favor the participation of low productivity firms to international markets while instead focusing on soft frictions can be a way to uh, both increase trade and uh, improve the allocation of resources. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm going, yeah. yeah. Uh, so one of the things I thought you were talking about was just the fact that there's not this like perfect sorting um, of productivity and exporting. And there's lots of ways to kind of get away from that. Um, you know. As, Second, second, any sort of second uh, dimension of heterogeneity, whether it's you know a dynamic exporting decision or just drawing heterogeneous fixed costs. W what about the search friction is going to be kind of doing extra above one of those other mechanisms? So indeed, uh, just explaining uh, the randomness in export patterns and deviations from the pure sorting that you have in many uh, international trade markets has already been done before and can be done using various uh, ingredients. Um, so what is uh, uh, specific and the reason in a way why we chose to uh, um, focus on this particular type of frictions is because uh, we wanted uh, uh, to tackle this question of the potential misallocation and the distortion in competition that these frictions are going to, to induce. So in particular, if we compare with the uh, literature, uh, um, the, uh, the, one of the important moments in the data that we are going to exploit is the fact that in firm to firm uh, trade data, you see a lot of heterogeneity across exporters in terms of the number of buyers they uh, uh, reach in a given destination country. So this particular moment in the data, you can explain by assuming that there is, uh, for instance, two-way heterogeneity between sellers and, and buyers. And there is some form of uh, associ assortative matching between these two populations that explains the heterogeneity that we, that we observe in the data. So this interpretation in a way says that the heterogeneity that we see in the data 
is efficient. So we wanted to uh, use a very simple model and take the opposite view. So it could be the case uh, uh, that uh, this heterogeneity that we see is in fact uh, reflects in fact some form of, of uh, misallocation. And this is the particular question that we tackle here and uh, the reason why we focused on this particular form of reflections. Isabel? Yeah. Um, Yes, I had a, a quick question. So we talked about it. I mean, you, I, I'm sure you're going to come back to that later. So you know, feel free to postpone. But uh, I was just wondering when you talk about inefficiency, whether you're thinking of the, the decentralized equilibrium, equilibrium relative to a frictionless world or relative to a constrained, uh, a constrained planner that faces the same search frictions. No, here I'm going to, to compare to the frictionless economy, which is going to be basically Eton and Cortum, the Eton and Cortum model. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, if there are no further questions, so this uh, paper relates to uh, very large literature, and I'm sure I've, I'm missing some uh, important references. So basically, we see the contribution as uh, um, the paper has contributed to uh, mostly two uh, literature. The uh, literature that has uh, um, investigated the impact of information frictions in international trade, which is vast and quite old, and it's uh, vast both on the theory and the empirics. Um, in this literature, the paper which is probably the closest to us is uh, the paper by Das Gupta and Mondria, which is also introducing information frictions in a Ricardian uh, framework. Uh, what is uh, different is that uh, in this paper, we are also going to, uh, um, to contribute to this recent literature that is exploiting farm to farm trade data that I was uh, just mentioning. Uh, and which is uh, documenting heterogeneity in the number of buyers that a given exporter is able to serve in a given destination. And as I was saying before, uh, the, uh, the, the stylized fact that we're going to start with in this paper uh, are similar to uh, stylized facts that have been already discussed in, in this literature. But what is going to be very different is the way we explain this heterogeneity in the context of our model. So instead of having some form of assortative matching that explain uh, this uh, uh, heterogeneity by some form of uh, exon, uh, deterministic, um, uh, uh, some form of uh, exante heterogeneity between buyers and sellers, we are going to explain this entirely by this friction. And from that point of view, uh, the paper which is closest to us is the new uh, paper by Ethan Portman. Um, so this is the kind of uh, roadmap for the talk. So I'm going to try go very fast on the stylus facts because, as I was saying, they are not very different from um, uh, similar uh, facts recovered from different data sets uh, uh, in previous papers. Then I'll uh, present the model and the predictions of this model. And I'll try to spend a bit of time on the structural estimation. So again, what is important is to convince myself and hopefully yourself that uh, the structural estimator, the moment that we use in the data, is informative about the size of these search frictions that I'm after. And then I'll discuss uh, the results. So the data we uh, use are uh, provided to us by the customs. And these are um, uh, now standard firm to firm trade data. So the specificity of this type of data set is that for each trade transaction, it's possible to identify both firms that are involved into the transaction. So we have information about the exporting firm, which is a French uh, firm, but we also uh, know or identify uh, the particular uh, uh, partner that this firm is serving in the European Union. In the rest, I'm going to condition everything on a particular product being traded. And uh, for this, I'm going to exploit information about the product at the eight digit level, uh, six digit level of the uh, HS nomenclature that I have access to. Um, we can map this data with some uh, additional information about the French exporters. And in particular, I'm going to use a bit the sector of activity of this. So just to give you an idea about the dimension of this data, we are going to use data for 2007. Uh, and uh, in this particular year, we observed uh, about 44,000 uh, French exporters that interact with half a million importers in the European Union. And these two populations form a network of about 1.3 million persons. 
As I said before, we are going to condition everything on a particular product, meaning that the sellers in my model are going to be identified as the, uh, a pair of an exporter and a particular product that this exporter uh, sells, and likewise for importers. So obviously, once we condition on a particular product, the size of the, the dimensionality of the network increases substantially. But something else that happens that was not completely obvious at first sight is that once you condition on a particular product being imported, you see that most importers in our uh, data set import a given product from a single form in France. So from that point of view, the structure of the network, once uh, we condition on a, a particular product, uh, features some form of many to one matching with most uh, buyers or importers interacting with just one product. So this is the assumption we are going to take afterwards in the model. So instead, if you take the other side of the market, the sellers, there, is, there are also many exporting firms that inter interact with a single buyer in a given destination country. But we also do see a lot of heterogeneity with about 40% of exporters uh, uh, selling a, a particular product to more than two buyers in a given destination country. So this has been already uh, um, um, shown in the previous literature. When we uh, do some form of variance decomposition, what we see is that more than 80% of the variance in the data in this particular moment, so the number of uh, um, partners I have in a given destination country, you see that 80% of the variance is within a product and a destination, which is exactly the dimensionality that we're going to, we are going to exploit in the analysis. Um, this uh, um, shows that uh, there is a systematic correlation between this moment, the number of uh, buyers I have in a destination, and the size of the exporter. This has been shown before. Uh, large exporters are those that manage to serve a large enough number of uh, customers in the foreign markets. Uh, in particular, this is consistent with evidence in Bernard et al. and Carvalho et al. And finally, this last kind of stylized facts that we uh, recover from this data is uh, uh, recovered from some gravity equation that we run at the firm level. So using a firm a specific fixed effect and identifying coefficient in the cross section of destination, we show very standard results. So the value of exports within a firm is lower in uh, uh, distant countries, in small uh, destination, and is also affected or correlated with uh, the stock of French migrants in the destination country, which we use as a very rough uh, uh, proxy for information creation. And as now standard in the literature, uh, what we do beyond this uh, firm level gravity equation is a decomposition in terms of the extensive and in the intensive margin. So the extensive margin is how many buyers I reach in this particular destination. And here what we see is that a lot the elasticity to distance and also to uh, the stock of French migrants in the destination explained uh, by the uh, uh, extensive margin. So again, these are stylized facts that are kind of uh, 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 standard to the uh, literature. The only reason why I wanted to mention them is that the model is going to replicate each of these uh, stylized facts and I'll, I'll show this, uh, I'll explain all, uh, later on. So the model, um, so the idea uh, of the model is uh, fairly simple. Is that, is that, yeah. Can you go back one slide for just one second? Uh, so, yeah. sorry, just to the data, one more. Like, um, so the log import demand equation, where you basically have, um, it looks like these guys grow 60% um, by exports per buyer. Um, so in some models, you would basically have like a 50-50 split between the two, like in an inventory model, you, that's what you would have. Is there anything that um, this split kind of tells us um, ex ante about like the types of frictions um, or is this or and then the other thing is, is this somehow like consistent across other data data sets that the split is, you know, 40, 60 or something like that? Um. I'm not sure I haven't. I, I would need to check. So my my expectations would be that that yeah basically what we find is is fairly uh, uh, standard and and consistent across data okay. sets but i, I would uh, need to to check okay. so afterwards so basically what what 
so afterwards, the model is going to really focus on the extensive margin, so the number of buyers that a firm is serving in the destination, and actually we're going to discard the intensive margin. Um, um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, just, you know, certain models would sort of split you up on like, I mean, I, I know inventory models, and it would split you up 50, 50 on like, you know, bigger shipments and more shipments. Um, and that's kind of what's going on here. It's just more buyers and bigger shipments. And so, um, anyhow, I, I had something in my mind. Please continue. <laughs> Um, so the idea of the model, and uh, um, again, the model is quite stylized. Uh, the idea is fairly simple. We embed the search frictions into the Eton Core 2 model uh, by assuming that there, uh, there are in each country a discrete number of heterogeneous sellers and ex-ante homogeneous buyers. And these ex-ante homogeneous buyers are going to meet with a random number of heterogeneous producers of a perfectly substitutable good. And then conditional on their random choice set, everything is going to be as in Eton Cortum. So they are going to shoot the, to interact with the lowest cost supply. So all of the heterogeneity exposed is going to be driven by the uh, uh, randomness in the matching process. In order to have very simple uh, analytical results, we uh, rely on a number of simplifying assumptions. Everything is going to be uh, uh, made in partial equilibrium. And also a second simplifying assumption, which is more important, I guess, is uh, that we are going to assume marginal cost pricing. So even though we depart from the perfect competition framework uh, by Tonet Cortum, uh, once we have these search frictions, we are going to stick uh, to the assumption of marginal cost pricing and, and rule out that uh, conditional on having met a buyer, a seller is going to exploit its market power to uh, set higher prices. So this is really a useful assumption that does not change the, uh, the, the structure of the matches because uh, uh, in any case, the buyer is going to be willing to interact with the lowest cost supplier, but this ha uh, having a more sophisticated pricing equation would uh, complicate a bit uh, the analysis. So now we are working on a second paper with Francois Fontaine and Julien, uh, which is kind of a dynamic version of the model in which we have more sophisticated price dynamics. Um, so on the supply side, the model is very similar to Eton and Cortum, except that we have a discrete uh, number of uh, suppliers uh, that offer the same perfectly substitutable varieties, but are uh, heterogeneous in terms of their productivity. So there are N countries, um, as uh, J sellers uh, in a given country. These sellers produce under constant returns to scale, involving some uh, input bundle which price we take as uh, exogenous and then the distribution in which uh, um, uh, productivities are drawn is assumed by it. So uh, the, the, together these assumptions imply that the number of firms which have a productivity above some uh, uh, values said in a given destination is distributed Poisson with the usual TJ uh, parameter that uh, is uh, uh, captured the state of technology in this uh, origin country and the shape parameter that uh, comes from the productivity distribution. Then there are iceberg trade costs uh, in, uh, for uh, sellers to serve a given destination country. And this means that the marginal cost of serving this market is inflated by this uh, iceberg trade cost. So together, this assumption uh, implies that uh, the number of firms from a given origin country that can serve a given destination at a cost P is distributed Poisson with this parameter. And then we can just sum up across origin country and we cover uh, the uh, um, um, distribution or the number of firms that can serve uh, uh, market I coming from any country, uh, which is also distributed Poisson with this parameter, whereby you can recognize e here the multilateral resistance term that already uh, uh, was already discussed extensively in Eton and Court. So obviously this in Eton and Cortum is uh, defined at the country level while again we work for a particular uh, product market. Um, so the main difference uh, has to do with the demand side of the model um, because uh, uh, Eton and Cortum assume a representative consumer in each destination while instead we are going to assume a large discrete number of ex-ante homogeneous buyers, uh, which have isoelastic demand function and homogeneous isoelastic demand function. 
which are willing to purchase the, the good uh, to the lowest cost supplier possible, but they only uh, meet with a random number of such suppliers. So the price at which they are going to purchase the good is the minimum among all the price codes that correspond to uh, firms they've met. And this omega bi here is uh, um, um, uh, represents uh, the random choice set that a particular buyer bi uh, is uh, uh, under with. So regarding um, uh, friction, so the assumption is that each uh, supplier from a given origin country has the same probability of meeting with a buyer from a given destination country. So this obviously simplifies a lot uh, the analysis. And this means that the sum number of sellers that a given buyer will meet uh, in uh, uh, destination uh, J is also distributed Poisson uh, with a parameter that depends on the number of sellers in all countries and the uh, probability that one of these sellers is met by this particular buyer. So obviously lambda ij is the parameter of interest that we are going to try to identify in the data. It's inversely related to uh, search frictions. So when lambda 10 to one, we go back to something which is very similar to it on the cartoon. And this is what we are going to estimate. So I often uh, get the question of uh, um, how strong this simplifying assumption. So obviously the, the assumption that lambda is the same for all uh, sellers, uh, no matter their productivity is a very strong one that is going to be uh, very important. So in the paper, we also discuss an extension of the model whereby we allow this uh, um, matching probability to be a function of the seller's uh, productivity. And we discuss how this can affect and uh, our results and in particular what predictions are consistent to uh, assuming this type of heterogeneity. But in the rest, I'm going to mostly focus on this simple case in which lambda is constant is the same for all suppliers from a given origin country. Isabel, a yeah. question. You said several times about partial equilibrium, but that's not really, that's just because you're not there's nothing precluding having general equilibrium. No, no, no. There's nothing precluding. So the, the only thing is that I'm, yeah, no, I'm, I'm just taking uh, uh, the factor prices as uh, exogenously given, but it would be kind of easy to have uh, a continuum of uh, sectors and some uh, um, uh, utility function at the level of each buyer. And whenever there is enough symmetry across homogeneous buyers, we can kind of easily sort the model in general equilibrium as well. So can I come back to the, the pricing um, of the, the firms being competitive? Um, so I, I, usually in these search models, there's some sort of hold up problem um, that gives you some market power. Um, and the search frictions are basically making it give, makes it not hold up problem. It gives you some monopoly power on these guys because you can't very easily switch between the two. So I, I haven't, I haven't figured out like if there's like a particular kind of sub market structure with all these produce suppliers who are kind of identical that, you know, justifies that assumption or if it's just, you know, a shortcut at this point. Um, no, is, as I said, I, this is really a shortcut. Uh, so the way we would justify is that you could imagine some form of price posting as in the labor literature. Yep. So firms engage and ex ante on a particular price. And then because there are many such firms, the price converge to the marginal cost. But exposed, the firm might be willing to exploit its uh, uh, pricing power. And in that case, what we know is that given, I mean, under Bertrand competition, uh, yeah. the uh, most productive or the lowest cost supplier is going to price at the, the cost of the second lowest supplier and thus exploit its pricing power, which is uh, determined by the outside option of uh, the, the buyer that is determined by its random choice. So this is what we do in the paper with uh, Francois Fontaine and Julien Martin. Um, I think we could handle this um, um, for the same reason that, so basically it's kind of the same thing. Um, uh, so the Eton Corto model assumes perfect competition, but then the Bernard et Tal uh, uh, Bern, uh, yeah, um, um, extend this to Bertrand competition, and most results keep on, on, on working, although there are additional predictions regarding, uh, obviously, uh, the, the distribution of prices in, in equilibrium. So 
I think it could be doable to do this in the context of this model. Afterwards, we're mostly exploiting information about basically matches, how many uh, firms I'm going to end up being matched with. And this does not depend on the, the assumption regarding prices. So this is why we decided to stick to this uh, simple assumption. <clears throat> so given all these assumptions, uh, now I can derive a number of predictions. So in particular, it's relatively straightforward to show that in the context of this model, the minimum cost which is uh, 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 drawn by uh, um, bias in country I is distributed variable with uh, a scale parameter that is the product of the multilateral resistance term in Eton Cortum and this additional kappa i uh, uh, function, which basically measured the mean level of frictions in uh, that buyers in market i are uh, uh, um, encountering while trying to purchase the goods. So kappa i is basically defined as the expected number of suppliers I'm going to meet divided by the total number of suppliers I could have met in the absence of uh, such frictions. And what this implies is that, by definition, kappa is lower than one, meaning that these frictions are going to inflate uh, prices. The reason being that buyers are no longer able to identify the most productive firms, thus uh, they end up paying the good at a higher price, and this tends to increase uh, uh, average prices. The second thing that we can see from this uh, definition of kappa is that the size of the distortion is going to depend on the correlation between the lambda ij, so the size of bilateral soft frictions, and this term here, which measure basically uh, the comparative advantage of uh, suppliers from j in country i. So if you expect that such frictions, for, for instance, might be correlated with iceberg trade cost, uh, there uh, might be here, uh, um, uh, sorry, a negative correlate, uh, Posi uh, uh, positive correlation, meaning that such frictions are high, uh, especially in those destinations in which iceberg trade costs are, are high. And in that case, the impact of such friction is a bit like less uh, uh, um, uh, painful because it's going to affect mostly firms that in the absence of such frictions would not be super efficient anyway. But there is also a possibility, which we show is uh, true in our data, which is that uh, lambda ij might be correlated with the structural comparative advantages. So uh, what this implies is that search frictions are especially painful for exporters if they hit those product markets in which they are on their comparative advantage. We'll uh, show that this is the case in our data. So from this, we can derive um, product level uh, trade in a way which is very similar to Eton and Cortum using the law of large numbers across uh, buyers uh, purchasing this particular product. We can show that the share of a particular origin country J in a given destination ice consumption can be expressed as the probability that any buyer in I end up uh, interacting with a, a seller from J. And this in this model is the product of uh, this ratio, which is basically very similar to the trade shares in Eton and Cortum, times this uh, measure of uh, the magnitude of such frictions affecting uh, exporters from J in comparison with the mean level of frictions in the destination market. So this uh, is uh, um, uh, important because it means that trade frictions in this model are going to distort the geography of trade in comparison with the Ricardian case. And we can show anomalously that in this model, uh, uh, these trade shares are increasing in lambda, meaning that more such frictions systematically reduce the volume of bilateral trade. And this is consistent with uh, the previous literature, people have been uh, interpreting trade frictions in a broad way as potentially uh, um, 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 uh, encompassing both physical trade barriers and information frictions, and assuming that both types of friction are going to reduce the volume of international trade. So from that point of view, this means that we cannot expect identify such friction separately from physical trade barriers by only using this prediction because the two uh, frictions have, uh, are isomorphic uh, from that point of view. So in order to reach uh, identification of such frictions, we're going to go a bit deeper into the data. 
can use the model's prediction in terms of firm level uh, um, uh, export probabilities. So this uh, uh, um, uh, equation gives you uh, the probability that a particular seller from J, which is endowed with some productivity level, is going to end up serving a particular buyer in country I, uh, which we can uh, show is independent of uh, the particular buyer under consideration because ex ante those buyers are, heter are homogeneous. What we can show as well is that this probability is the product of the probability of meeting with this particular buyer and the probability of serving the buyer conditional on having met her. So the first term is constant by assumption uh, and is just lambda ij, but the second part is a function not only of the various uh, frictions in the model, but also uh, the level of productivity of the firm. So what this means is that our model uh, um, uh, predicts that the probability of serving any particular buyer in a destination is increasing in the seller's productivity, which is going to be useful to replicate the stylus fact I mentioned before, which is that high productivity firms, large firms, are uh, more likely to export and also more likely to serve a larger number of buyers conditional on export. The second thing which is interesting with this equation is that there is a non-monotonicity in the way search frictions are going to affect uh, uh, export probabilities. So in particular, we can show that there are two conflicting effects. On the one hand, if you reduce search frictions, all sellers are going to be more likely to meet with all buyers in the destination, and this tends to increase the probability of exporting to each of those uh, buyers. But in the meantime, conditional on uh, a match, more, uh, less frictions also means that competition is fiercer and thus uh, um, um, firms uh, that have met with uh, buyers uh, are uh, less likely to win the competition. So these two effects go in the opposite way and we can show that the first effect, the visibility channel, always dominates for high enough productivity firms while instead the second effect, the impact of such frictions on competition can uh, dominate uh, for uh, low productivity firms. And this is quite intuitive. Basically, low productivity firms are the ones that have no chance to be able to export in a frictionless economy or in an economy which does not display high frictions. So in order to get a chance to export, these firms necessarily need to be lucky and this requires large enough self frictions. So this non-monotonicity is, uh, um, uh, we argue, uh, important and uh, useful to later identify uh, such frictions. In particular, because we can show there is, uh, we can show there is not such an impact uh, uh, when we look at the impact of, uh, sorry, iceberg trade cost on the probability of exporting. So another way of saying this is that what the model implies is that a high productivity firms export premium are uh, obviously positive, they are more likely to export and to export more conditional on exporting, but uh, they are also uh, increasing in the kappa term, so meaning that more uh, distortive search frictions are going to reduce the competitive advantage of high productivity uh, sellers. So this is here, uh, we discuss in the paper how robust this finding is to a more sophisticated assumption, in particular assuming that uh, potentially the uh, probability of matching with a buyer might be correlated with my productivity. And we uh, uh, show that under some reasonable assumption, the non-monotonicity that we discuss uh, uh, is robust to uh, this more sophisticated assumption. So this is kind of done with the uh, model. So the last thing I need to do in order to confront the model with the data is to go from these uh, probabilities to uh, the expected number of firms from a given country that have exactly uh, M uh, uh, buyers, M uh, uh, varying between one and uh, BI. Uh, so this is uh, the moment that we are going to observe uh, in the data. And so we derive an analytical formula for this moment, which is this H i j of M uh, that we can show depends on the trade shares that we observe in the data, uh, the uh, number of buyers in the destination and the lambda i j. So this moment, uh, this theoretical moment is going to be useful to identify lambda i j uh, in a structural way. So no questions on the model? 
Okay, so I have. Uh, Isabel, I ha yeah. Yeah. Yes, I had a, I mean, a mo more of a comment than a, than, than a question, but so again, I mean, it's again relative to if the efficiency properties of, um, of the mall. So, so I understand now that, that you know, the efficiency statements are relative to the frictionless world. And so here that you can see that the, the frictions do distort the, the allocation of, of, of uh, exports. I think there's a, there's a, I mean, given the randomness of the, of the matching process, there is a, there's also an, an externality in the sense that relative to what a constrained planner would do, a planner that takes into account the search frictions, uh, which is kind of a, which, got, which is gonna come from these, these pooling externalities that you get uh, when, when you know, heterogeneous firms are gonna choose between, uh, between these markets. And I think what would happen in, um, in your environment if you, if you endogenize the way firms, you know, where they, you know, where they decide to search for uh, buyers, uh, you would get that the the, the highly productive ex exporters would you know, concentrate too much in the thick export markets where there's a lot lots of buyers. So I'm not entirely sure what what you know how that would uh, compare to the 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 baseline inefficiency, which is you know the direct impact of search frictions. But I think it would be interesting to uh, to, to, to to think about that. If no, that's that's a very good point, and um, yeah. I don't have any answer, but uh, it's uh, it's indeed an interesting uh, question that we we haven't really thought about. Okay. But isn't it true that in this model, the the buyer gets to uh, choose across a bunch of potential suppliers? So they're not. I was thinking it was different than the kind of model Adrian was thinking about in the sense that. You, there's no constraint on how many uh, buyers can be um, the supplier can know about or how many suppliers the buyer can know about other than the search friction. So there's not really, it wasn't clear to me that there would be this, this kind of pooling issue because of the fact that you get to choose across all the potential buyers and choose the lowest cost one. You don't get stuck uh, with a suboptimal mm -hmm. one. Uh, uh, sorry, so but, I mean, there's... no, I no, guess it's not. conditional on 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 having a, a more sophisticated search uh, uh, technology whereby firms choose. I mean, there is a search cost, and then there is an endogenous uh, search effort. No, exactly, exactly. It's at the stage, Sam. It's at this. I I would imagine that it's at the stage where these lambda ijs or determined if these are endogenized through matching function and through some search uh, cost, as, as Isabel were saying, that this is where you would get the, the externality. Okay. So, so I have like a more, um, I think, less interesting question. Um, so I, I guess I, I could have thought about this as, as there being like a, a destination specific trade cost, but then there's also like a buyer seller specific idiosyncratic draw of the trade cost that then leads to these probabilities. Um, and then, you know, you would have like more, more easily, stuff would more easily substitute and it would be kind of falling more naturally into the standard Eaton Cordon framework. Is, um, is, is that like another way of interpreting um, the model that you're running? It would lead to different pricing because these guys would have different trade costs, but it would, it would lead to the same thing where you're going to have like one to one that or, you know, many to one matching. No, no. Uh, I mean, I, I certainly agree that there are other ways of generating the same types of uh, um, heterogeneities that I'm discussing here. And indeed having more randomness in the distribution of, uh, um, of uh, trade cost is a potential option. And this is be, uh, uh, what in a way uh, Eton Gortum and Kama are doing in the Econometrica paper, having more degrees of randomness of heterogeneity across funds in order to match better the randomness in export patterns. Uh, so here in a way, what we do is to give a bit of uh, um, um, micro uh, uh, interpretation of this randomness in terms of these uh, search frictions. And uh, the, the, the thing that it buys us is to, to have these clear predictions regarding the distortion to competition because, because of these search frictions, we are going to have a distortion that favors systematically uh, the low productivity firms. While if you will explain this by pure uh, randomness in uh, the 
size of trade uh, cost, you would need to impose that the form of this randomness is also correlated with uh, a seller's productivity in order to reproduce this, I think. I'm not sure I answered your question. But. No, I just think there's a way of interpreting everything in terms of um, these match specific trade costs that lead you to, you know, with some matches, the trade cost is basically zero and some matches it's infinite. Whereas if you had like a extreme value draw, you would, it would be more easily to move people across matches. And I don't know how, how much this is going to affect like the elasticities that you're going to going to have when you kind of take the model of the data and think about things, but um, uh, I'm not sure. I haven't, uh, yeah, I don't have an answer. Okay. I would need to, to think about it. Uh, okay. Um, so <clears throat> once we have these analytical predictions, we can uh, basically use this structure and uh, the property of the model, which is that we have this uh, distortion um, that uh, uh, can help you identify in the context of this model the search friction separately from other barriers to international trade. Um, so we discuss extensively in the paper why this particular moment is insightful and whether it would still be insightful in a slightly different uh, world. So again, I already discussed the fact that we think of uh, this prediction of the model as being robust to having uh, um, um, uh, meeting rates that are correlated with uh, productivity. We also discuss um, um, extensively how uh, this particular prediction, uh, um, I mean, how different this prediction is in comparison with the impact of other barriers to international trade, both in this model and in an alternative model that features monopolistic competition. and. Uh, fixed cost of acquiring uh, additional customers. And um, basically in the paper, we argue that this distortion is uh, likely to be uh, um, uh, useful to capture uh, these uh, frictions. So the rest is relatively straightforward. We have this closed form solution for the moment that we observe in the data. So basically we can just use it to recover an estimate of the lambdas. Um, we are not doing exactly this. We are trying to tie our hands a bit more because we really want to convince ourselves and the reader that what we, we identify is orthogonal to other barriers to international trade. So this, uh, um, the way we decided to proceed is by choosing a moment in the data that is uncorrelated with distance. Um, although, of course, search frictions might be themselves correlated with distance, but we thought that any correlation with distance would potentially mean that there is an impact of other barriers to international trade that could potentially pollute our estimation. So what we did is to search for different uh, transformation of the, the uh, moment. So what we show is that the number of sellers that a firm is connected to is systematically correlated with distance. I already mentioned this. We see that it's not sufficient to normalize by the number of sellers with one buyer to get rid of this uh, um, uh, correlation. But what we find is that if we use the variance of all these ratios, we can obtain a moment which is empirically uncorrelated with distance while it's still correlated with our proxy for information frictions, with this, which is this stock of migrants in the destination country. So at the end, we decided to work with this particular moment uh, that we can um, compute in the model and measure in the uh, data. So the idea is that this variance in these uh, um, uh, uh, ratios across M is going to capture the curvature of this distribution that I mentioned before. While we are not, we are not going to use the level of this uh, particular uh, distribution. Uh, the rest is uh, relatively standard. We use asymptotic early squares, which is a form of GMM. Um, the only thing that is a bit tricky is that the moment involves a BI, the number of buyers in the destination country, which we recover by using another prediction of the model and um, 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 exploiting the number of French exporters to a given destination together with the share of French firms in that destination. Um, and uh, we compute estimated standard errors using the optimal matrix as recommended uh, in the literature on asymptotic least squares. 
So this is just a summary, uh, some summary statistics uh, about our estimates. So at the end, we managed to estimate a lambda for about 10,000 different products and destination country that uh, uh, cover. Uh, so at the end, we are going to use uh, um, about um, um, 10,000 coefficients that cover 15 countries. And we select countries so that we have a large, a large enough cross section of products for each of those countries. In terms of the interpretation, I think it's better to, or it's easier to interpret our estimated coefficients in terms of what they imply, uh, in terms of the probability that a seller would meet with no buyer in the destination country, which is this one minus lambda to the power b, uh, because obviously lambda cannot be interpreted without knowing how many buyers are in the destination. So on average, this probability is, uh, I mean, uh, the median probability is relatively low, but we do see some peaks, some high probabilities that reflect high degrees of frictions, in particular at the very top of the uh, distribution. The first thing we do with this, some sort of external validity check is to correlate those estimates with some uh, product and country characteristics. And this is what I was mentioning before, the size of the correlation that we obtain, we think make uh, sense if we interpret our estimates in terms of search friction. They would not uh, make uh, uh, much, much sense if we were instead interpreting those in terms of other bias international trade. So in particular, what we find is that the level of frictions that we've estimated is correlated with distance and it is true again even though the moment we've used wasn't correlated with distance so such frictions appear to be stronger in distant uh, uh, destination they are lower uh, they are higher uh, sorry they are higher in those uh, uh, countries that are more populated which we interpret as a potential impact of a denser uh, country uh, for search cost and we also find that there is a positive correlation with our proxy for uh, information friction. Uh, when we, uh, so this was uh, done in the cross section of destination within a product. When we look at the heterogeneity across products, we find that first this dimension is quite important in driving the heterogeneity. So the, pro the, the search frictions do vary quite a lot across products. And we find that uh, search frictions are more, uh, are, are estimated larger. Uh, for uh, differentiated products than in markets that are more organized, which I think uh, makes sense. Uh, another form of um, sanity check uh, consists in looking at uh, the correlation of our estimated search frictions with uh, a particular product program which is conducted by Business France, which is the export promoting agency in France, which has a program which is meant to help uh, small firms uh, uh, export by uh, basically uh, um, 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 targeting specifically search friction. So what they do is basically to organize some meeting between firms and uh, foreign buyers, or they could also like pay for some fair trade, uh, trying to help those firms that are selected as being relatively productive, but that are meant to, that are supposed to lack visibility and help them meet with uh, foreign buyers. So what we do is to correlate the intensity of uh, uh, the activity of the agency in various destinations with uh, the mean level of frictions that we estimate for those destinations. And to the extent that uh, Business France has some privileged knowledge on where uh, uh, exporters have particular difficulties meeting with foreign buyers, we should expect a positive correlation, meaning that the export intensity, uh, uh, the 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 activity of this uh, export promoting agency is particularly intense in those destinations in which we estimate large stock friction. So this is the case. Obviously, there is a lot of uh, caveat to this exercise, but we think of this as suggestive evidence that uh, either we are indeed capturing stock frictions and all uh, business France is uh, targeting well uh, uh, various destinations. Um, I need to speed up a bit, so I'm going to skip uh, the model feed. Ah, no, you wanted to see it? Or? Sorry, one question on the last one. I mean, it, I kind of buy your argument, but it is kind of interesting because you're saying that the agency in France is smart enough to target where they're needed, but they're not very effective in the sense that even though they're promoting the exports, they haven't brought 
the right hand side down. So um, that, that's a fair, a fair point. So the argument is that basically this program is quite small. I, we are not talking about massive uh, investments. So in our data in 2007, this concern uh, uh, 3,000 different firms that have benefited from the program and about 1,500 that have benefited from the program in uh, Europe. So. Um, Ideally, this would uh, become something more important and potentially this could help uh, 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 reduce those search frictions. But at that point, I think it can be effective at the individual level. I would not expect to this type of activities to have kind of a general equilibrium effect. Um, uh, so this is um, basically uh, testing the model. So if you remember, one prediction of the model is that search frictions are going to reduce uh, uh, unambiguously the volume of bilateral trade. And we test for this prediction of the model in, our, uh, uh, in the data. So by regressing uh, the share of French uh, firms in a given destination on various gravity equation plus the estimated soft frictions. And we find that uh, the impact goes in the expected direction is highly significant, meaning that indeed we find lower bilateral trade flows towards those markets that we estimate are highly uh, frictional. Along these uh, 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 search frictions that we estimate explain as uh, much as 55% of the variance that we observe within a product across destinations. So this is quite substantial. Finally, uh, I can go back to my uh, uh, initial question. Um, so uh, here we do uh, two main things. One consists in uh, um, um, looking at uh, the question of the distortion, uh, distortion induced by those search frictions in a kind of qualitative way. And here what we do is to correlate the magnitude of search frictions with some estimate of Ricardian comparative advantage that we estimate based on a model consistent gravity equation. And so what we find here uh, is uh, that uh, there is a negative correlation meaning that the level of search frictions is uh, the highest in those markets in which on average French firms uh, enjoy a comparative advantage. So this, is, I think, is a quite important uh, result, which uh, might not uh, uh, be true in all uh, countries, but it means that in the context of uh, French exporters, such frictions in the European Union are likely to be quite uh, distortive because they are uh, the most painful in those, uh, for those product markets whereby French exporters otherwise would be in a good uh, competitive position. The second thing we do is more quantitative. Uh, so we uh, run a counterfactual exercise using the Greek market as benchmark because in our 50 countries, this is the most frictional country that we have on average. And we simulate what would happen if uh, frictions were reduced to the mean level, which we observe in the least frictional country, which is Belgium. And we compute the impact that this counterfactual reduction in such frictions would have on the volume of trade and uh, the uh, allocation of uh, market shares between terms of heterogeneous product, uh, productivities. So in terms of the volume of trade, the impact is quite uh, limited. So when we uh, do this kind of substantial reduction in search frictions, we find that the level of uh, uh, the market share of French firms increases uh, by 1.1 uh, uh, percentage point in the median uh, product. Uh, um, and of course, this is done everything else being uh, uh, unchanged. But we find that there is quite an important impact in terms of the allocation of resources across heterogeneous producers because this reduction in soft friction reallocates market shares from low to high productivity firms. So this is the impact that the counterfactual has on export probabilities along the distribution of uh, productivities that we recover from the INSE data. So in the actual data, what we see is that even at the top of the distribution, the probability of exporting in Greece is relatively small, while in the counterfactual, it's uh, substantially increased at the top of the distribution because once again, once those uh, high productivity firms gain in visibility, they manage to, uh, uh, they manage to uh, uh, export to this destination more frequently. 
So this impact is substantial, even though uh, many firms lose in terms of their export probabilities. Uh, and we see that this impact of a uh, 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 shift in the distribution of export probabilities is reinforced by uh, the intensive margin, which in our model is the number of buyers that uh, firms manage to serve in the destination. So at the bottom of the distribution, it's basically equal to one, whether in the actual data or in the counterfactual, because at that level of productivity, if you're lucky enough to have one uh, partner in, in Greece, uh, you usually don't have uh, more than this. But at the top of the distribution, what we see is that there is a very substantial impact. Reducing search friction increases by a lot the number of uh, uh, partners that French exporter manage to uh, serve in the destination country. And together, we show that this implies uh, an increase in the mean productivity of exporters, which is uh, 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 quite big, uh, by uh, 6 to 11 percent, depending on the assumption that we make about the uh, heterogeneity of firms. Um, uh, we show that the export premium for high productivity firms increased by a substantial amount. And finally, what we do as well is to compare this counterfactual with another experiment in which we reduce iceberg trade costs uh, in a way that delivers the same impact on market share. So basically, in order to compare, we have the same impact on the volume of trade. But what we show is that reducing iceberg trade costs in, instead is going to benefit in relative terms low productivity firms because these are the ones that really suffer from a lack of competition with respect to their foreign partners. And this means that this counterfactual induces a reduction in the productivity of exporters by about uh, the same amount uh, in absolute value. So this, I think, is an important result that uh, might be the main takeaway from uh, this paper. So if you think of, uh, say, uh, uh, export promo uh, promoting agencies as having various tools to try uh, foster international trade, uh, we think of uh, those tools that may uh, particularly target search friction are being uh, especially good uh, instruments because they are going to both increase the volume of international trade and also uh, reallocate market shares towards the firms that are the uh, most productive. And this is it for uh, my presentation. So again, search frictions we think are uh, uh, um, an interesting object to study at least because uh, they contribute to reducing trade between countries, but uh, in a way that is not isomorphic for the trade buyer. So if you think of the trade literature, it's sometimes, uh, uh, I mean, trade frictions are sometimes as, uh, uh, interpreted in a, in a broad way as uh, encompasses both physical trade buyers and search frictions. What we want to emphasize is the fact that those two frictions are very different because they, one has, uh, uh, um, they are very different allocative uh, um, uh, consequences. Um, uh, and um, as I was saying, this means that uh, reducing search frictions might be an especially interesting uh, policy object. Okay, great, thank you. So now we're just gonna open up the floor to questions, comments, discussion. Uh, you can just jump in or you can raise your hand if you like, either way. Isabel, can you, um now that takes a little more time, can you explain how your moment worked that kind of uncovers the search friction? It was like a variance of how many buyers you had relative or the fraction with a certain number of buyers. Exactly. So I think the best is to look at the graph. So the starting point is basically within a product and destination, the heterogeneity across firms in terms of the number of buyers they have. The problem is that uh, this, so this uh, uh, ratio, for instance, um, I mean, the number of firms with, say, one buyer in the destination in the context of the model is correlated with trade shares. So it's lower. Yeah. Uh, right, right. So, so the first thing you want to do is to normalize by one of those, uh, those uh, numbers. So what you can do is to take this and normalize by the number of firms with exactly one buyer. In theory, this, is, this uh, ratio depends on lambda, but is independent of other uh, barriers to international trade because basically the trade shares can fell out. 
but what we see as well is that uh, this so these are the ratios that i just described uh, this one are also correlated with distance uh, uh, so the number of firms oh, with I two see. Saying empiric kind of theoretically that one's good but then it, empirically you didn't like it because of its correlation uh, with distance Exactly. Uh, theoretically, it would work, and actually at the beginning we had started with this, but since part of the concern is that you can identify this separately from other frictions, you might be concerned that this correlation reflects some form of misspecification in your model. So what we decided is to basically tie our hands even further, and instead of using all of those ratios, use just the variance for a given product and destination in those ratios. Right, so then... So in, in practice, end, in practice we have, so we are going to take, uh, say, three values for M. So we compute how many sellers have two buyers divided by how many sellers have one, how many have three or four divided by how many have one, how many are, have five or more. So we use really the beginning of the distribution and there is the most of the variance. And then we take those three ratios and we take the variance of those ratios. And it's okay. that thing from just that statistic, you're getting that amount of, I mean, I guess what was impressive is that that statistic gave you quite a bit of power in those regressions that you did later. No, exactly. Yeah, we saw that, uh, yeah, at the beginning we had started with the ratios and then, um, yeah. People were asking again about the, the, this possible, uh, like, uh, misspecification and the correlation with like, that cause. But still, yeah, we do have quite a bit of heterogeneity, including when we use this single moment, which is summarizing just the curvature of the distribution uh, for each product and, and country. So there is quite a lot of heterogeneity across product markets in terms of the curvature of those CDFs, and this is what allows us to identify uh, quite a bit of uh, variability in these uh, search frictions. Right, but then, and then the fact that actually turned out to be quite correlated with bilateral trade, I guess, is, didn't have to be that way, I guess. No, no. The other thing that uh, this, this using this moment by us is that basically when we do the fit, so in a way what we use is really the curvature, but we never really like target uh, the, the level of those ratios. So what I think was a bit, uh, I mean, satisfying for us is that the model uh, um, reproduces pretty well both the curvature and the CDFs, but also uh, the level, except for Luxembourg, but uh, we discussed in the paper uh, uh, this in particular. But on average, we find that we explain something like 25% of the distribution in the level, the number of firms with a particular number of products, just with uh, our lambda. So we saw that this was kind of good. So when I think of goods in which France has a comparative advantage, and this may just be a stereotype, but I think of uh, goods that have more quality differentiation. And I'm wondering if maybe the correlation between France's comparative advantage and the magnitude of search costs might be because uh, these are products in which we'd expect to see higher search costs. And in particular, because they, they have more differentiation in quality and France is producing higher quality stuff. Um, yeah, this is a fair point. I haven't really thought about it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's always a bit difficult to, to, to define what is quality differentiation. Uh, in general, what we find, which is uh, expected, is that such these frictions are large in, uh, in differentiated markets and this is also where uh, clearly France has a comparative advantage. We are not producing much homogeneous goods, I guess. Um, so this differentiation yeah, might uh, materialize in terms of uh, uh, quality differences. I would need to think about the way it would affect uh, both the 
moment that we use to identify the search frictions and the, and the, the comparative advantages. I don't have a good answer to this question, I must say. Yeah, I don't see it as something that you could potentially model easily, but it could be something no, no, to no. look at in terms of the correlation. Yeah, exactly. Thinking about how this could potentially affect, uh, I mean, the question is whether this could affect the moment that we use to identify the so-called search friction. So potentially we capture something which is related to quality differentiation. But uh, yeah, I would need to think about it. Uh, Kim, we can't hear you. Ah, classic. Uh, <laughs> you think after all this time, I'd figure that out. Um, I was just going to say, if we don't have any other questions, then we can turn off the recording feed and sort of officially uh, end the seminar. And then if anybody wants to stick around and ask more questions or, or, uh, or make comments, they're welcome to. Um, otherwise, next week's who is he? Pull up. Next week is uh, Gabriela Mundaka from the World Bank talking about carbon pricing and international transport fuels. Uh, and then I'd just like to add for those of you who are interested in presenting, you can follow the link on the web page to submit your name. Uh, we're always looking for, for presenters. Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, have a good week and I'll see you guys next week. <laughs>